look and There is some help on the, on the horizon. That's right. And then okay. last but not least is Jess, who doesn't like to be on film. Oh, I know exactly how she feels. I know. And speaking of being on film, we're going to take you off film and we're going to do the demo. So. Okay. Uh, let's minimize this like that. And that. And then we have a bunch of stuff here. Um, so I really apologize because it is DrupalCon, which means every single hour of every single day has been something, and so I'm not totally at the speed yet. So we ship beta, which is pretty cool. Yay! Yay! And there's like 10 commits already. Yeah, I would hope so. <laughs> oh, we're actually in beta now? See, this is what happens when I just sit and code all day and I like never- Wake up, Adam. Up. No, this is what happens when you don't wake up at 3 in the morning. That's actually <laughs> that's 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 Oh, okay. It was just done today, right after no, the keynote. <laughs> so like at 10 a.m., um, whatever time zone we're in. Yeah, there's about 10 minutes. I was really wrong. Wrong. Okay, but the best is I ran into a tech journalist in the lobby at about, at about 1 or 2 p.m who was telling me his plans for everything oh. he was going to post to get Nothing as soon as up. as soon as 8 goes beta because it's going to be so great. I was like, you know that about four hours ago. <laughs> <laughs> we actually solved that problem. <laughs> Poor guy. All right, so what I'm doing here is I'm installing Drupal 8. Cool. Angie, I can't see your screen. Do you think you could share it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do that. <laughs> and you can't see the reflection on her face. There we go. It's not like 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 like sometimes that happens. Do that again. Um, and so, um, at a high level, what the tool is, is it's a, uh, it's a Drush plugin. Is everyone in here familiar with Drush? Cool. So it's a Drush plugin and it has two modes. One is an analyze mode. And what analyze mode will do is it will actually uh, take the uh, module and it will scan through all the code and then it will give you a report with some nice like red, yellow, green coloring. Um, that explains to you all the code changes that happen and what you need to do in your module in order to fix it. And it has links off to the API change records for each thing. So for example, if you have an old Drupal 7 style info file, um, it will warn you about that. And it will link you off to the change record that explains what we're talking about when we say info YAML files. Um, and it does that for pretty much everything. Um, the second mode is the DMU upgrade mode, and what that will do is actually attempt to auto-convert the module from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. So real quickly, um, I have a module here called Pants. Um, so the steps involved is, uh, there's a couple steps. One is you have to drush DL Drupal module upgrader, and that uh, downloads the module and puts it in the modules directory. Um, so let's actually do that. So you're Drush. using uh, 8x 0.4, right, Angie? Yep, I'm pretty sure we haven't tagged since then. So yeah, we, we definitely haven't, and I'm just making sure because um, judging by the state of master right now, we should. So. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Wait. Yeah, I don't know when Drush started doing this. Is it asking if we want the dev release or the 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 tag, basically? And I want the tag because I took special care to make sure it actually worked. But that was like a week ago, so it might not work anymore. So the second thing that you need to do, because this is using all the Drupal 8 fanciness, is you have to run a composer install. Um, and com do people know what composer is? Pierre, maybe not. Maybe I know, but yeah. So composer is. Um, it's essentially a, a package manager thing for, um, is that it, really? Yeah. Doesn't need symphony on it, okay. Uh, the only master needs symphony parts right now. Oh, good. Okay, um, so what Composer is, is think of it as like Drush Make, but for PHP. 
So you can put in there, actually I can show you this, um, you can put in there, um, you know, here's some metadata about my project, um, here's a requirement that I have and I need to get exactly this library and this thing, and then here are the different keywords that you can use to search for my, my plugin. It's basically a better info file. Yeah, a better info file is a, is a good way to do it. Instead of just declaring dependencies, it can actually grab them and put them into your uh, source tree. So I'm going to turn on the Drupal module upgrader. Uh, oh, right, it doesn't show up there. I'm sorry. Yes, I have to do that with Drush. So Drush EN Drupal module upgrader. And then once I do that, I get the two commands that you were talking about. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to go back to my Drupal root. And I'm going to run Trush um, DMU Analyze, and I'm going to say uh, Pants, because this is the module I want to analyze. Um, and it'll churn for a little bit, and then it will tell me, oh, I've generated a report, which you can find here. This used to just kind of spit out command line garbage, but um, that wasn't very pretty. And also, this gives us more ability to do different things. So the uh, Analyze report is pretty simple. It's just all these various reporting things, and if you can expand any one of these, it will link you off to documentation. It will also explain where in the module it found those problems. So in this case, it found a call to user access, which has now gotten converted to a different thing. If I click on that, um, I'm taken to the actual change record. And here's where you can find out like what you used to do in Drupal 7. Now this is what you do in Drupal 8. And here are all the related issues on how we came to make that change to core. Um, and I highly recommend, if you don't know Drupal 8 yet, you should really, really stick to the um, to the analyze mode for the for the initial few things because it's sort of like you don't want to learn HTML in front page because that's like too much um, it does too much for you so you don't understand the mechanics but once you've done this a few times a lot of this is going to be really really tedious and then the DMU upgrade mode will actually help with that so that's the that's the um, analyze mode if I do DMU upgrade pants I'm really worried we're going to get an error but maybe not okay that looks good. Um, what I can do is take you over to module pants, um, do that and do that, and you can actually see some of the stuff that it does for you. So one of the things that it does is it, uh, it, there's a new configuration management system in Drupal 8, so it automatically creates both the uh, settings file, so it takes anything that was in a variable get call and writes it out to a settings.yaml file, and it also covers the schema YAML file that you need with the CMI to support multilingual. So having that done for you automatically is really, really, really key. Uh, other things that it will do, for example, is it will convert any variable get or variable set calls to the new config uh, system. You'll see a lot of these like arrow thingies and stuff in Drupal 8 because there's a lot of conversion to object-oriented programming. So one of the things it can do is it can find any call to something like this and convert it to something like this. Um, so we see that a lot. It also has this knowledge of, uh, or this notion of, um, I don't know what to do with this, so what I'm going to do is comment it out so you don't get errors, and then I'm going to leave an app fix me that has a link to further information. And I don't know how that, there we go. So it's saying, I don't know what to do with this, but if you follow this link, um, then you can get more information on how to do that manually, since it's not something I can do with so then Places where we punt uh, on things like that would be, uh, for example, um, Anything where there's logic involved, so you know if you have a hook menu and there's an if then in there, we have no like short of like actually evaling that, which could do all kinds of horrible things. We have no way to parse that into the source tree, so we just we basically punt. Um, so here's some more kind of conversions to different things. Um, it converts your info file to an info YAML file. Um, that's the new structure in Drupal 8. Drupal 8 in general, there's a lot of stuff where it's moving to. Um, um, kind of to standards like YAML instead of our own special thing. Here again, doesn't know what to do with field create field or field uh, create instance now, so it just comes them out with a fix me. Um, these links.menu.yaml, and later on there'll be a routing.menu.yaml, that's it taking your hook menu, which is like setting up all your page URL mappings, and it's uh, writing it out to the new routing system. So it creates the, the YAML files to register the metadata, and then it'll actually generate the class files as well, which we'll see shortly. La la la, more of that same kind of thing. Scroll faster than this. Um, yeah, here's that routing YAML file I was talking about. So automatically generates that for you so you don't have to read it. Um, it even can deal with some certain subset of the plugin API. Um, and the, the big thing that it did as of the last couple weeks is it actually take, if you have automated tests for your Drupal 7 module, 
to explain, okay, my, tech, my module is working. It'll actually port those to Drupal 8 as well, um, which is fantastic because then you, instead of like relying on all these errors you're getting from Drupal module upgrader, which may or may not know about certain APIs yet to flag them, um, you'll actually be able to tell in simple tests that you're missing this and this and this functionality of your, of your module, and you just keep fixing things until it works. Uh, here's an example of the, like what page uh, callback functions turn into. So now they're classes that extend a controller base, and here's an access callback, here's a page callback, and more or less it just takes the old code and just chucks it into the new place. Um, and it does that for you. It also covers the form API. So this is, a, for example, a configuration form that's extending from config form base, um, automatically generates your form ID, um, you know, your submit form, it moves over everything, your build form function, and that sort of thing. So again, the goal of this thing is to eliminate a lot of tedious, busy work that you would otherwise have to do manually yourself. It's never gonna be 100%, right? It's never probably even gonna be 80%, but what it can do is the stuff that can be automated, and the stuff that just turns into boring, mucky work, it's done for you. Oh, this here is um, an example of converting uh, blocks to the new plugin system. So it actually knows how to take a hook block info. And um, it's sort of cheating right now. Like it's just uh, calling the procedural function with the right key because it's really hard to break apart a switch statement inside of uh, a hook block info and stuff like that. Um, but uh, there's maybe other ideas that we could do there, but uh, this works for now. Um, and here's the test that were converted. So mm -hmm. it does things like you're extending from a different base class now than you used to be. This protected profile setting is new. A couple of other things that have changed in the testing <coughs> API. It just does those little tiny conversions so that if you actually run the test uh, thing, you, you can see that. Um, yeah, and then here's the upgrade info report. Um, and then you might look at that and be like, yeah, okay, that looks good, but like, how does that actually work in practice? And the answer is, I don't know how that works in practice because I haven't run this in a week. <laughs> so let's find out. Um, so if I enable the pants module and I click save, we'll see. It takes a nice. long time to click this page in Jubilee right now. We need to work on the performance a little bit. Ah, it saved! That's cool. Sometimes it blows up with a fatal error, and then we have to fix some things, but you know, that's pretty cool. Um, if I go under Manage, and I go to Configuration, and I uh, look here, it actually converted my pants administration page, so I click that, and you can see that the configuration form is also converted. There's some errors there. We're not seeing like a list of things I could change, so the plugin API, the TC tool stuff that converted, but you know, if I save the form, it saves, so things are actually starting to um, you can even see if I go to the, the block layout page, pull that up here for a second. Um, I go down here, I see the change pants block up here. I can actually click and I can place that thing. Uh, let's place it in the, uh, I don't know, sidebar first region or something like that. And uh, I think I have to save this again. And then if I go back to my site, uh, <laughs> you know, there's some errors. There's always going to be errors, right? But the point is, there's errors, but the friggin' block shows up, which is pretty cool. I mean, it's not showing what's supposed to be showing, but game system, I think. Yeah, we're working on it, right? You know. Um, and then the one last thing I wanted to show you, because this is the part I'm really excited about, is um, if I enable the testing module, <clears throat> which is somewhere. Why am I doing that? I just show this awesome new thing in Drupal eight. Which is if I do this, test. oh, look at that. It's right there. Boom. Um, oh, yeah. And I have it set in development mode, so it's showing all the test modules. So just ignore that. It's fine. Um, but anyway, the testing module, for those who've never used it, is, um, well, it's kind of horrible. But it's great in some ways, in that you can write these tests that are like, go here, click on this thing, and make sure that this text, text showed up there. Um, which is really handy for doing uh, testing just to kind of get a gist of how your module is working. So Sorry, if I go simple, under, what's simple that? Simple test, right? Simple test, yep. So if I go under here and I go to testing, um, I don't need that anymore. Come on, you little kid. Yeah, there's two testing systems in Drupal 8. There's simple test, the old one, for legacy purposes because we, we have a lot of integration tests that are doing that, that kind of click here and do the thing. And then PHP unit is another style of testing, um, which, which is another new thing. And that's for like a unit test. So say you want to, um, you want to take a particular function 
and you want to see if I, you know, it's a function that adds two numbers together. So you want to test what happens if I add one and one? What happens if I add buffalo and zebra? What happens if I add null and negative 47? You know, like all those kinds of things that you can use PHP unit to, um, to deal with that. So if I click here for pants and I run the tests, See, I should have done that and then started talking, because now we have like three minutes to wait here for this minute. Anyway. Um, but what it'll eventually do is it'll show um, the results of the test, and then that's sort of your to-do list for your module. So if you haven't written tests for your Drupal 7 module just to cover the baseline functionality, it might be a good idea, um, because that can be really handy when you're pouring using Drupal 8. So that is my demo. Uh, any questions so far? Yeah, Matt. I just want to say that I think that the conversion of tests is amazing. Oh, great! That's the conversion amazing. of tests is amazing. I mean, that, I mean, yeah. What you said, you know, like convert the tests, try and run, you know, try and run the tests, see the failures. I mean, that's you know what you're supposed to do with TDD, right? Yeah, exactly. And if you want, like, well, I, I just did uh, Drush DMU upgrade pants, and that just does everything. But you can actually uh, help. What's the parameter you pass where you just want to do one test? It's dash dash only. So it will be Drush DMU. Here, I'm going to type it in the chat here. Uh, Drush DMU upgrade pants dash dash only tests. Something like that. that tests with a capital T. Tests with a capital T. This one? Yeah. Yeah, so if you wanted to. Oh, uh, yeah. Because, yeah, I want to try. Oh, wait, no, not, I was in conflict. Yeah. So if you, if you wanted to be hardcore and do this all yourself, you could just do the tests. No, but that's legit, right? I think everybody who has never done a Drupal 8 module before should totally not take the easy route the first time through because it, it's too easy and you don't know what's changing and why. Um, so this is a good thing to do if you want to just get the, the hit list from your test and then go through the analyze report and try and fix all the things. Well, you wouldn't actually, I want to just interject, you wouldn't want to just only do the test thing because that wouldn't give you a module to the test. You also at least need to do the input again so that at least... Yeah, uh, oh, you're right. I was right. like, yeah, so I don't mind. think you can test it. I am completely module. wrong about everything. Don't listen to anything. <laughs> but, so I mean, most modules won't... Well, right. I mean, doing a DMU upgrade <clears> won't necessarily... <throat> I mean, that's a good first step. I, I, I guess I don't see how it's cheating. Because I, I don't see many modules actually being able to do DMU upgrade and then it magically no, all working. There will be no modules that can do that. Right. Um, I mean, unless someone is really, really, really into contributing to this thing and making it cover all the bases. Speaking of which, that would be a great segue over to Adam to talk a little bit more about what's on the hood in DMU uh, itself. Okay. So, yeah, the way this works, and I'm assuming we're all, I'm guessing we're all developers here. Um, in fact, I know we're all developers here. So, um, the way this thing works under the hood is that it's based entirely on plugins. Um, and the point of a plugin, of a DMU plugin, is basically to take some isolated piece of a Drupal 7 module and convert it to Drupal 8. So, by an isolated piece, I mean, say, the info file um, is a good example, or like permission, you know, just to kind of deal with one single thing. And the ideal is that you could run like a single plugin in isolation. So as Angie just demonstrated, like if you just wanted to convert your tests, it should be able to take just your tests and convert those, or just your info file and just your tests and convert just those parts and let you do the rest. So that's sort of how the that's sort of the idea of the plugins. And there's a few different, and like it uses basically just a normal Drupal 8 plugin system uh, for which there's very extensive documentation. And it's similar in some ways to the uh, C++ plugin system in Drupal 7. Um, and sort of the entry point of creating a plugin is, well, let me back up, there's like a few different plugin types basically. Um, hey Adam, I'm going to show them like the, I'm going to browse through the source tree for a second just to show yeah. them kind of how it works. So um, can you direct me on where to go? Yes, uh, if you go into tree, well, tree or whatever. Yep. Yeah, go into SRC. Yep. And then plugin. Then DNU. Yeah. And then module wide. So this is sort of the basic plugin type. For a DMU plugin, um, and this is what you, this is the kind of plugin you create uh, if you wanted to extend DMU yourself. 
Um, and this is, I call these module one plugins, that name might change, but what this basically means is like, as you can sort of tell from the naming, it's like, okay, here's a plugin that manage, that handles the conversion of book help. You know, here's a plugin that handles the conversion of book init. So when you call Drush DMU Upgrade or Drush DMU Analyze, um, what it does is it basically scans only these module wide plugins or any module that's implementing plugins in the namespace plugin DMU module wide. And then it just executes those plugins on your target module. Um, you know, it'll either do an analyze on that target or it'll do a convert on that target depending on what you did, but it just directly scans for this plugin type and executes those. So to, you know, to convert some custom hook maybe, like if you have a module that uh, defines hooks, you could create a module-wide plugin that had, that knows how to handle that hook um, and put it in the plugin DMU module-wide namespace and have DMU pick it up when, you know. Adam, is there a good one of these to look at just so they can get an idea of what a plugin uh, Yeah, look at it. I look at it and hook, and hook exit are pretty good and relatively simple. Okay. So looking at one of these guys, I'm uh, still down a bit. Yep. He like from the annotation says, okay, I have this plugin called Hook It In. And here's what it does, and here's some documentation about, you know, the change that it's covering. And that last thing, Hook equals init, says, oh, by the way, I cover Hook It In. So what that means is that like upstream and sort of in some of the parent classes, it's going to say, oh, okay, I'm going to scan this module for a Hook It In to see if we even have one. And if we do, I'm going to call the convert method here. And then what this convert method does is basically it says, okay, I want to use it. I want to take a template here and generate a, an uh, event subscriber class, which is how you do hooking in the equivalent of hooking in in Drupal 8. So it sort of uses a template to generate a class, and then it saves that class. And then it says, okay, target module I'm defining an init subscriber service that you have, uh, which is again part of converting to hooking in, and um, then just saves out that class as src event subscriber init subscriber .php. And that's pretty much it. That's the whole. That's how to convert it. So that this is a pretty simple one, I'd say. It's just like, you know, we know we have hook in it because like convert only gets called because hook in it exists and has to be converted. So you know, run off a template, save it out, finished. And yep. oh, define a service, then finished. Yep. So what's the difference between generating and converting? <clears throat> The difference between generator and convert, this is actually going to go away uh, pretty soon. I'm removing this. I'm in the middle of removing this kind of stuff from master. But what generate does, it's only for, that's only, that's part of the class generator trait, um, which is imported there at the top of the plugin. And what that does is it's just used by plugins whose conversion routine is expected to create a new class of some kind. So an example for that is like, uh, you know, if you're converting a form, like a Drupal 7 form, you know, you have to take these functions, like, you know, the builder function, the uh, validator, and the submit function, and you create a new class, and then you throw these functions into that class. So that right there would use class generator trait. Um, yeah, more about HTML docs, what is that? Yeah, I just want to call up when he's talking about templates, we actually yeah. use Twig for this, and so, yeah. like, anything so. where it's writing on a class is just, like, you put these little placeholder variables in it, I like this because I know how to make these things. <laughs> I don't know about event subscriber yucca yucca, but I can totally do this. <laughs> so, so, so like the most simple ones, like the most simple of these plugins are generally kind of like that. They're just like, okay, generate a class from a template, mm -hmm. you know, and that's basically what they are. And the module wide plugins have a pretty, they're pretty, uh, they're fairly open-ended in the sense that they can get really super complex. Like uh, the hook menu one is very, very scary. Um, like when I say scary, I mean scary. And uh, that one's because like just hook menu is extremely complicated. So if you have a lot of uh, wiggle room in what a single plugin can do, um, and any plugin can also they can make use of other plugins as well. Um, pretty much unto infinity. So you could have, you know, functional placement is actually an example. It uses a sub plugin type, and then those plugins could in turn call other plugins, which would call other plugins if they wanted to. It can get, it can go pretty far. Plug inception. Um, <laughs> plug inception. <laughs> yeah. I guess it's it's uh, yeah. That's just like all plugins have the ability to delegate to other plugins, and functional placement is a prime example of that. So. I actually should talk a little bit more about functional placement because that's kind of important. 
Um, and what that is, it's a sub-plugin type. It's only used by the function replacement plugin. And what that's supposed to handle is like a lot of the time, um, converting something is a matter of basically you have a function call, like, um, I don't know, what's a good one? Like user save, that's gone on Drupal 8. We now call, you know, user entity, user variable, you know, arrow save, parentheses. Um, so that's an example right there of saying, okay, we have this function call and we have to change it to something else completely. So that's kind of handled by what I call a function call rewriter. Um, and the point, and that's an example right here. Um, and what a function call rewriter does is it basically says, okay, I want to scan the original module for every call that happened, for every single call to user save, for example. And then for each one of those, I want to call this rewrite method on it. And the rewrite method has to return um, a replacement, something that I will just replace that entire function call with. And that's what this does. There's a little bit more theory in there, and it kind of gets into how into how this thing ties into Barbarous, which I'll get to in a second. But um, that's kind of the point of a function call rewrite. Um, and then a lot of conversions are like that. So that's why there's so many function replacement plugins in that. And if you back up a bit, Angie, mm -hmm. um, you'll see there's the, uh, it's in the plugin DMU function replacement namespace. All function replacements go in there. So you could also implement your own plugins in that same namespace um, to handle rewriting custom functions that are part of your module, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think so. But so essentially, the process of writing one of these is figure out what kind of conversion you're doing. Is it like info to a bunch of classes in YAML stuff? Is it simply replacing? Is it is it literally just as simple as grep? Because we have a plugin for that where you just add a key and a value to a YAML file. Is it something where it's almost a grep, but it's a little fancier than that, where you have to switch the order of parameters or something like that? Then you use a function replacement. And then in any case, you can. Um, you know, you use the ID to identify what string is it that you're looking for in the module when you know, like, oh, this is what I need to pay attention now. Um, right. And then you can add links to documentation, um, all kinds of other stuff. Mm -hmm. And then uh, this syntax here is, is Farberus. So we're not using regex, like, to parse the thing, because that would be horrible. We're also not using raw PHP tokens, which is what we initially started with, because we were using uh, PHP code sniffer. Instead, Farberus is like this like sort of meta layer PHP parser on top of tokens. So you can deal with it in this nice syntax like get arguments and create an object method and then, you know, append another argument to it. So yeah, it's a tree. Gives you yeah. a tree. It's, it's, it's tree. tree. Sorry. Yeah. I'm going to yeah. shut up about Farberus because you know way more about that. Uh, well, no, I mean, actually, we do, I should mention how, how this thing ties into Farberus, so... Well, just one sec, we have a question. For yeah, so the yeah. analyzer part is just analyzing the... the Comment, um, the comments are what spit out your your message, right? The oh, what's that called? Sorry, like you're, you're pretty far away. Annotations. Like Sorry. I think he's saying the. Um, Hold on. Oh, there. Yeah. Ah. Okay. Go. The annotations are what you use to scan the module and uh, uh, and then spit out the messages. Correct. <laughs> You mean like when analyzing stuff? Yes, when yeah. analyzing stuff. Well, when analyzing stuff, we're not really using the annotation. Um, I wouldn't say we're using the annotation. There is an analyze method. Like any any plugin at all has two methods, has at least two methods it has to implement, and that's defined on an interface. Um, if you go into SRC, um, well, converter, uh, and then go to converter interface. I guess. See, that's the interface that every plugin has to implement, and it only has three methods. Um, the first one uh, is executable, basically says, do, it asks the plugin, do I even apply here? So an example of that is like uh, a hook, like the hook init converter. Um, if there is no hook init defined by the module, then there's no point the plugin even running. So that's what is executable, of course, just like, hey, check out this module, can you do anything with it, if not, just, pass over it. Um, then there's this analyze method, and the analyze method's job is to take the module and, you know, and then basically just scan for whatever problems the plugin is supposed to find. Um, so to use the hook in it example, analyze would say, okay, well, there's a hook in it 
implementation here. Um, so that's a problem, and I'm going to I want to flag an issue that says you have to make an event subscriber, and here's some documentation about it. So the analysis is done for like flagging issues and determining if there are issues and what those issues are is always done by the analyze method. So, so maybe the question, then, the question I'm trying to ask is in that uh, converter, there wasn't an analyze method. Right. Right. It was inheriting um, a default one. Ah, okay. And so that re that default one grabs grabs the message. Does that grab the message from the annotation? Then I'm trying to figure out yeah, what. Yeah, it does. Yes, in the okay. default one, it does. Um, yeah, and it basically I see. Okay. Sort of the default one. I honestly yeah. think it's kind of stupid right now, but uh, <laughs> it basically just says like, "Hey, if I re if I got here at all, we got a problem, and I'm going to flag it." Um, so that's that's pretty much how the default analyze works. But yeah, like that's generally most plugins are inheriting a default. Great. So we basically you don't have to rewrite that one if we're writing plugins. We can just right. Write Not unless you wanted to make like more. Yeah, you'd only want to change it if you uh, wanted to have more complex analyze logic. Like uh, info YAML is a good example uh, because it's like well you know if you have a I want to mention an issue that you don't have a type key in your info file. Um, but you know, maybe you don't have a files array, so I don't have to say anything about that. You know, so that right there, like analyze is actually flagging issues conditionally. Yeah. Uh, so, so if yeah, right. yeah. if it has dependencies, then flag that. If it has files, then flag that. Um, rather than just blindly taking everything from the annotation, which. Right, but most of the time, like the mere presence of, like, say, you know, you find a call to you for save, the very fact that it exists is a problem. Mm -hmm. So that in that case, you could just use the default analyze method. Cool. All right, great. Um, yeah, did you want to switch to talking about Farberus? I did want to mention a little bit about how this ties into Farberus. So, and then we'll the set way, the stage for Cameron. So, yeah, like as Andrew said, we're not dealing with tokens. We're not dealing with regex. Um, we're using uh, Cameron's library, which is a PHP parser. Um, that's a very, very accurate and rock solid PHP parser, and it gives you kind of a jQuery ish way to uh, parse and manipulate PHP code. Um, and DMU relies on this entirely. Um, so basically, when you, like, if you're writing a function replacement and you're implementing your rewrite method, for example, like a function rewriter, um, what you're going to receive there is a, is a node from a syntax tree, a barber syntax tree. You're going to receive an object that represents a node in the tree that's for that uh, for that particular function call. Um, and yeah, and that's and from there you kind of use the barberist API to and your you use the barberist API to create a replacement and return that and it gets swapped in with the original thing. So basically, the actual conversion logic is entirely done with Barbarous. Like, inside like a rewrite method or a convert method, you're pretty much handed, DMU pretty much just says, okay, here's some nodes that represent what you have to change. Um, do whatever you gotta do with them. And from that point, you use, you're using Barbarous to work with it. So, I don't even know if I made, if that made a lot of sense, but uh, that's kind of the idea. I think so. So Drush wraps the entire thing, and that's what gives you the analyze versus upgrade command. Then right. what either of those commands will do is they will effectively, um, um, they, they run a set of plugins that convert things or analyze things. So all plugins have an analyze, convert, and is executable method where they can react on different conditions. Um, right. And then you use annotations to essentially, you know, say what type of thing is this, when does it need to react, and what's the, where's the documentation on where to find more information. Um, right. And then inside a convert method, when you're actually manipulating source code or checking source code or that kind of thing, then you use Farberus. So it's sort of like three layers. Is that a proper? I would say that's a pretty accurate description. You can so listen yeah, to me great. again. I said something. <laughs> All right, cool. So yeah. now um, I'm gonna kill my screen share, maybe, and then um, Cameron, did you wanna yeah, talk I think about I'll Farberus? Draw. Yeah. So I have a okay, Sharpie so. here. Oh, there's Sharpies over there. All right, I'm going to move you. Yeah, I want to see this. I don't know that I need you on the... Well, <laughs> well this cord is super long. Let's see if we can make this work. All 
All right, so now we will position you like that. Hey. Wait, yeah, sure I can see the right board. This is awesome. Sorry? Oh, and we should make sure that his camera is still set. Um, yeah, so talking the low level here, if you want to write plugins for <laughs> Adam's DMU, if you want to add to it, help contribute to it, uh, you need to understand what Fabris is actually doing. So uh, Angie was talking about the code sniffer before, and it works at with tokens. Have any of you ever played with token get all? So I'll, I'll just yeah. write it out. It's rough like stabbing yourself in the eyes. Yeah, we originally did it in every <laughs> single That's filled with rust yeah. and character. bees. Just, yeah. just going to take a simple stabbing expression the brain. here. <laughs> so what token get all will do, I'll split it up into like pieces. So this piece here is a T variable. Um, that's a token. That's a token, which is like a T alum. Right. I might get some of these token names wrong. And, and that's a token. That's a token. That's a token. And, and actually, in white space here yeah. is a token. It's a T, T white space. Don't forget that. <laughs> so, in PHP language, um, some of these types of tokens are used in different places. Like, you can go, for instance, have some code where you go namespace, um, my namespace. But then also, I don't know if you've noticed, you can refer to something in a namespace that's a sub in a sub namespace of the one you're in by going namespace sub namespace my class. So when if you're working at the token level, you don't. How do you distinguish between that's a T namespace token, that's a T namespace token? So instead of having to deal with um, the grammar all the time, like what tokens follow others in order, um, I made Fabris. So it'll convert it into a tree. So for this um, a equals one plus two, you actually get a tree um, where you have. Oh, yeah. Just simplify it because I'm just ignoring the white space for a second. <laughs> so yeah, that's once you've got a um, tree. So it's how Adam was saying before. It's sort of like jQuery-ish in that. Yeah, because it's like a DOM in a way because you've got this tree of nodes. So you can kind of like nav transverse it and manipulate parts of the tree. So that's what the Fabris library is all about. Is um, navigating bits of the tree, pulling out the pieces you want to be able to modify them. So, uh, yeah, so before we brought up the, <laughs> that API and you'll see there was a lot of classes. And that's because there's like a class for each type of thing, like element. Like, so for an add operation, that's, that's add node. So if you wanted to just modify or add operations, you could by filtering. I don't know what you would, but you could if you wanted to. You can. There's like a jQuery's got a find method, um, and you pass CSS selectors. But instead, uh, in Fabris, you could go um, on my tree. I want to find, and then it's got this. I go filter um, is instance of. Uh, it's a bit verbose. Uh, then you can go and find all add nodes, essentially. I'm shorthanding some of this. Um, and then that would give you a node collection of just add nodes. And then you can loop over them. Then you can, like jQuery, you can chain off of it. Then I could go like each and give it a callback function and, and interact with every add node in the, in the tree. So, some of the main ones, as Adam was saying, with the func they're like this one for function um, function call node, which is what that function rewriter is that correct, Adam? Function rewriter. Function call rewriters, yes. Yeah, it's it's looking for function call nodes, and then checking function certain fun if it matches a function name. Like you might want to replace. Um, 
uh, check underscore plane. Like this is a pretty simple one because it's pretty sure it's got one argument. But in uh, D8, it's. Uh, I don't even know what it is in D8. Green. I don't even have to do it anymore. Check. Well. <laughs> I know if you got D7 code, you might have course check plane, right? You want to. Place no, it. he's taking that twig auto escapes everything. But you could try okay. escape. But off. maybe you want double escaped. Um, ah, ah, maybe. <laughs> I'll pick one yeah. once he's already got like no, the no, no, that's access. Good. Yeah, that's a good one. I only did this one because one of my core patches was for that. Nice. Uh, so you can go. I want to get your tree. I want to find filter all instances of function call node, and then you go where. Um, then you can go on that node, get its um, function call name, which would be check plane, and if so, I want to replace it to be uh, class method call of this. So that's the sort of thing you can do with Fabris. Mm. Get pieces oh. of the tree and extract out what you want and replace that part of the tree with a different thing. So you could get a function call and convert it into, um, I think it's called class method call node. So, it is. Yeah. yeah. And there's some convenience functions that I've been working with Adam to make it easier to do more common things. So you can just go, I want to get a function call node, convert it to a class method node. And that's right, and that's how you would convert check plane to string check plane like that. Yeah. That's you know, you could also, there's, I mean, a, there's other things you could do, like if you wanted to continue to make, like if you didn't want to convert it to like a class method call, you could just get the function call node and you could say, set name and just rename it, you know, change it from check plane to, you know, the plane text or whatever. So, um, so you could modify it in place or you could completely replace it. You could just give it something totally different to swap in in place of that form or node, if that makes sense. So say that this was the thing you were trying to change into this. Yeah. What could you pseudocode out some example of what the Farberist syntax would be for that? Yep. Top of my head. Yep. I, think so. <laughs> I like putting people on the spot. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so if you wanted to do that, it'd be. Let me see. Um, yep, yeah, fine. So, there's this. Oh, these filter methods are just any callback. Um, I just got a convenience class that's got a few common ones. Like, you might want to find nodes that are a particular instance of something. So, I've got. Uh, is instance of um, which takes a string oh by the way this, some of this is better when you're using 5.5 5 .5 features of PHP but um, so I want to find function call nodes should we I guess it'd be okay to use five five to do. We've been debating versions. that, yeah, whether to raise the requirements of, of yeah. DMU to five five, even though Drupal eight will only go to right. four, five four. Because it's going to still yeah. publish your module in five yeah. four. Because uh, mostly when you're referring to like class names and that, because five five's got the double colon class, you could just write function call node double colon class instead of writing it. It's um. Oh, uh, actually, I think we've even removed that. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. It's so pseudocode. It's, yeah, it's pseudocode. So then, um, a fine method like in jQuery gives you a collection of all the matches. So then I want to go for each one of them and pass it a callback, which gives me um, a node. And those, I actually could put the type there, function call node, because you only get, get function call nodes. And to be clear, these are not Drupal nodes. They're they're like Sorry. PHP. Yeah. Nodes. I, when I say node, I mean tree nodes. Yes. Because like, it's a tree, so it's common with compiler people on compilers. They say nodes for the trees. Um, what was I doing? Converting it to that class method call. Uh, yeah, and then it would be. Oh, totally off the top of my head. I think there's a thing that says convert. Um, Adam, do you know that? Uh, I would, isn't it replace with? Uh, is it? Yep. Yeah. Probably. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. 
<laughs> yeah, it's very, like I say, it's very jQuery-ish. We even use the same, a lot of the same method names. So, so you have like replace with first, last, parents, uh, you know, next, prevel, next, all, stuff like that. Uh, to string colon colon yeah. check. Um, yep, I think this goes. Yes. I think it even takes it in that format. Yeah. I can't remember. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, and oh, sorry, that'd have to be an if too. We want to only replace. Um, ones that are of checkpoint, so I'd go if node, I hope my handwriting's not terrible, node get name equals equals check underscore plain. So tomorrow, and that, that, that would do what we're just talking about in that amount of code. Okay, so first you're taking um, the entire tree. Yep. You're trying to find things that are function calls. Yep. And then you loop through each of the function calls. Yep. And you say if it's a function call named check plane, yep. then take the thing that you're on, which it should be the check plane yep. function call, and replace it with this instead. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty. Like, if you knew the amount of code that was required to do that in PHP code sniffer, you would be kissing this man square up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it was pretty difficult how... Yeah. We just started, like, making shit up because it just was too difficult to... Yeah, so, um, yeah, I've looked at all the ones using tokens. I've looked at code sniffer grammar project. And they all had the issue of they were reinventing, like, grammar, the grammar rules, basically. Because right. I've went through all the effort of figuring all that out and giving you a tree. Um, you don't need to do that. You don't have to worry about all the little edge cases um, besides possible bugs in the library. I've tested it all of everything I could think of syntax-wise. And I was basing off um, the yak YAML, the yak file of what the grammar is for, for PHP 5, point, up to 5.6. So it supports 5.6. That's awesome. Um, I think I one this code's it's, not exactly right. But. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna totally convert this to code <laughs> and then whack you every um, error. <laughs> I, I think I forgot the pass to, to grab the argument that I had originally in the node. But. It's fine. <laughs> but do you guys gotta see the, the overall gist? Yeah. So I guess the the other thing that we wanted to actually talk about was, you know, so we got this tool and it kinda works and it's kinda awesome, but like we ideally want like everybody who's porting modules to sort of like jam on it and like help port because there's like whatever 937 odd change records for Drupal 8 and not all of them are seven to eight change notices so say it was 500. Um, you know in order to actually have a complete tool we need to cover like wide. We're planning like Acquia is funding the development of our piece of it, and Previous Next is funding the. Well, they're sponsoring yeah. their time to work on Farber, so it's sort of a joint venture. Um, and Acquia's involvement is we're like we're trying to hit like go deep, like we're trying to take the really soul suckingly hard APIs like Hook Menu. I'm so sorry, Anna. Um, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. I'm just going to need about 12 years of therapy. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you haven't started with entity API yet, so probably more like oh. 30, I know. So, oh, but that's what on. I mean, we're trying to take like the <laughs> ones that A, everybody uses, and B, um, are hard to convert, and Adam is full time with us until middle of November to just like get those Yay. done. Yay, I know, so Yay. it's him too. Um, there's just any kissing so. and hugging in this buff, that's all we have. Um, but, the, um, but the bottom line is, like, we can't do both deep and wide at the same time. And so what we ideally want to do is try and build momentum around this thing, get people contributing to it. I 
I'm not sure how best to do that given there are like six people in this room. What's tomorrow? So tomorrow there's the lab. The upgrade yes, and lab. so I'll be showing it at the lab, and I'm hoping there's a much bigger. Not that like this is great actually. Like a couple of people who really want to go deep on this and hardcore. I think that's awesome. But the lab won't be covering anything about the how to contribute bits. It's going to be covering the what it does bits. So my question is, if we're going to try, because I hope to get there tomorrow to help people get set up with that. Yeah. If we have more people um, hitting on this, we should be able to get data from what stuff is not being converted, like get build up a database That's of true. the problems yeah. people are yeah. having yeah. with it. So like getting people using it seems like that would be super useful tomorrow yep. um, as a first step. And then um, if there's anyone in there who's more interested, I mean, even if we find one more, that, that would be double the... <laughs> be double, the, yeah, that's true. So did you hear that okay, Adam? Uh, mostly. Yeah, he basically said, that's Jacob, he basically said, um, you know, when we have an opportunity tomorrow, where hopefully there's like, when we did this lab in Prague, there was a, at least 150 people in that room. I don't know that there'll be that many this time, because it's like, you know, Drupal 8. We've been saying for a while, it's almost out, and I think people are getting sick of hearing that. But with the beta. <laughs> but with the beta, I'm hoping they will be there. Yeah. So tomorrow is a good opportunity to show at least several dozen more people about this thing. Um, and then, here, you want to look at me instead of the whiteboard. Uh, <laughs> That would be great. And then we can have them filing issues. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe I'll do this. They just talk to them. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, <laughs> he totally just <laughs> went over there and like added his closing parentheses and thing here. Sorry, you had to be here. It was yes. I, I know. How it Perfectionist. Um, so anyway. Um, so they could file a bunch of issues and then I guess like between you and I we could triage those and maybe mark a couple of them as novice and then like give them some direction in the yeah. issue. Oh, that's just a grep replacement, so just do this and whatever. That might be a way to it's onboard a bunch tomorrow of people. Tomorrow at three, so I can help. It's on tomorrow that part. at three and, there, and no, no, there's two. There's twelve. Yeah, it's the two. earlier one. It's the, the one at It's two hour it's a two hour lab. Correct. I think it starts at um, one. One to three fifteen? Maybe. Sorry. Thirteen hundred to fifteen fifteen. That yeah. sounds right. It starts at 12. Real I have 12.45 to 3. So, Same thing. Cool. Yeah. Um, which is stupid o'clock for you, I think, Adam. <laughs> um, it's, 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 it's ass o'clock for sure, but uh, I don't know. I mean, I could be on IRC, um, you know, possibly for... What the hell time is that, anyway? So I think so, it's, no, yeah, it's, it's about seven. Starting time is 12.45 yeah, That would be like 5 or 6 a.m. That's a quarter to 7 in Eastern. Oh. Is it only quarter that's to 7? That's not that bad. I mean, I would do it if it was 5 a.m., but like if it's after 6, I and could it, make it. it like honestly, I could at least IRC possibly for like ad hoc hangouts for people who need any help or whatever, but, you know. And, and most of it honestly won't come in until about an hour after the lab starts. So I'd say like if you can get up early tomorrow and kind of be around for questions, yeah. that'd be great because we can redirect people to IRC as long as Wi-Fi holds out here, which has been an issue. Uh, yeah, I can be on IRC tomorrow. When, when was it again? 12.45? 12.45 our time. So like 6.45 your time to probably like to 8. 8. Yeah, I think so. Okay. I can, uh, yeah, I can do that. Okay, okay. sweet. Oh, That'd be okay. awesome. So then that's one way we can get people involved. Is there anybody in this room who wants to, knowing that you've had exactly like a 30 minute deep dive into the thing, no, seriously though, is there anyone in this room who would feel comfortable like leading a sprint on this on Friday because I'm probably going to be all wrapped up in core stuff. And while you know Farber's really well, you don't know like Drupal module upgrade or yeah. Drupal 8. So <laughs> yeah, I'm guessing no. I'm trying to focus on Postgres. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I'm sadly I committed as well. Yeah. Okay. So I don't think we're going to have a module porting sprint on, I think we'll have a module porting sprint. I don't know that this will be part of it. In the meantime, though, I can try and find someone tomorrow to run it as well. Who knows what will happen tomorrow and people will get yeah. interested, hopefully, in, in, in what this does. So they'll, yeah. they'll say, hey, let's try it out on Friday or Saturday or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. So I don't know, feeling in this room, and I know, Jabran, you, you came here a little late, but um, you missed all the awesomeness. <laughs> Too bad. But luckily, Jam recorded the whole thing, so it should be good. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Um, I think, I mean, what do you guys think? Is it yay, nay, I don't so, know. Think about just... Drupal module upgrader? So I, I have, you know, you know, trying to get more of the human element, you know, into um, how we, how you, how we up, up, upgrade our modules. I mean, it's something, you know, we heard it in, in a there was a session about, you know, 
the popular contrib modules where we're saying, hey, what's the status of your thing? You know, Commerce came up and says, we're rewriting everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. Oh, boy. Um, but, you know, the, we really want to, you know, as, as much as possible, you know, start using the tools that we made in Drupal 8 properly. And, and, and although we don't have a best practice guideline yet, I don't think, do we? Uh, so. um, there are some things that we can do now to, to really improve how testable our code is later. So, you know, trying to be not as procedural, <laughs> um, not, uh, don't inject, you know, inject your dependencies. And, you know, this is really hard. So, for example, in the pants module, you, do, you have variable get in a lot of places. And instead of doing that, and it used to, I don't think this used to be possible back when, you know, like two, two years ago, a year and a half ago. Um, you could do, you know, you can inject the dependencies now for, for the form, in form base and, and controllers. And that, you know, that helps make you know, things a little cleaner. Uh, and this, rather than calling slash, backslash Drupal. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think Adam wrote great. It's just a, it, I think, did you say the word, it's an accelerator? Yeah. Yeah. To, to get it was never, point. this thing, I mean, I definitely know that you, you're supposed to, um, I'm, can you spin me back around so I can ask you? <laughs> <laughs> hey, wait, oh, I'm sorry, I thought you had a question. Okay, sorry. Here we go. Hi. Um, yeah, it was, yeah, I definitely agree, like, I do know that you're, I mean, I was new to dependency injection. Um, when I started this thing, and now that lack of experience is biting me in the ass. But I do know you're supposed to inject your dependencies. You're not just supposed to, you know, replace just blindly replace every function call to variable get to like Drupal, big whatever. Um, but that being said, this thing was never meant to be a perfect module porter. Like it's meant for you to just be able to get a to get a jump start on refactoring it. Because I mean, let's face it, most Drupal seven modules, because yeah, as you said, we're moving from OO uh, from procedural to OO. Um, and so most modules are going to need to be massively refactored anyway. So this is just to get it so that you can turn it on, um, hopefully without errors, um, <laughs> get your tests running, see what's broken, and start refactoring. It's not supposed to be, uh, like, it, it would be abusing it to just run it once on your trip module and then, you know, hey, that's it. That's my 8x1x branch. I'm going to go commit that to D.0 now. Hashtag um, <laughs> although, I, although I would argue if you are trying, like, I feel like this module upgrader um, helps the human element because for people who haven't done D8 code yet, this gives them a first deep dive not only into what the D8 code's like, but they supposedly already know their code. And so they see what happened to their code. They can get an idea of, oh, that's what happens. And now they can start fiddling around with it. I mean, I know for our D8 stuff for panels, we just started committing some code because little increments are important. Obviously, it doesn't work yet. So actually, I'd argue it might not be a bad idea for some modules to, to actually do the DMU in the D8 version if they're porting. Put yeah. it up. Let people see it and start. Yeah. Start working with it. Yeah, I, so. I find like I don't really, like I, I'm a real stickler for just doing things the long and hard way because it helps me memorize. You know, get get muscle memory built up. Yeah. So like you know, I type git commands out like fully drush commands. I don't even use aliases. Yeah, I'm the same actually. <laughs> This book. No, no, that's hard. For whatever it's worth, I used to text that. I only started so, the PHP storm about a month ago, so. You know. I I really love the like the analyze portion and expanding the analyze portion to, to maybe take use uh, make use of best practices and say, hey, I see you're doing some some function call that I have no idea what's going on here, and you've defined it. This is something you know. Contrib does this. You know, we make cool new things that aren't in core. And we do weird things too. <laughs> we do weird things in core too, to be fair. <laughs> so you know, to say, hey, uh, you're doing We're this. We're wrapping up. You've got, um, you've got some. Can you find a jacket in here? A jacket. Um, yeah. that's mine. Um, because I lost mine. So <laughs> oh no! Uh -oh. Just trying to figure out. Um, so I, I think. Not under here. I don't think so. Okay, sorry. Oh, we lost on the big screen, but whatever. I can. Uh oh, I oh. kicked you. Oh. Yeah. What just happened? Sorry, we had a, uh, someone come we looking for lost properties. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we had a dependency injection. <laughs> so, I, like, we could 
you know, I think now that I've learned more about firmware, I mean, it, it seems possible you can you can analyze like these weird functions that we're you know we're creating or weird class names and saying, okay, I see you're doing this. You have these arguments. You have these things. <laughs> and and maybe you know kind of make some suggestions like, hey, you know, you should check out uh, some. Here are some APIs. I mean, yeah, like you used the example yesterday when you were talking of. Um if, if you detect a call to Drupal HTTP request or OAuth or something like that, that it's like, hey, by the way, there's this new Guzzle library, right? It's not really about converting, it's about informing people that there are these new cool things that and, you can use. And a lot of people learn their first module by like, converting. I remember my first was 4, 7 to 5. I mean, it used to be pretty useful. Mm -hmm. the, you know, you could run a uh, coder and yep. so... I still do it. Yeah. I still have a module, but... You remember Deadwood? 4, 7 to Drupal 8. Deadwood. It's my first. Vaguely, oh, yeah. that was first a long time yeah. ago. Yes. <laughs> I have, uh, let's say, maybe a silly question, but I ask anyway. I'm wondering if it would be a good use case when, uh, let's say, you're just working in Drupal 7 still, nobody's running in Drupal 8, but you're building a site and you run into some module that you're considering using. And uh, if, let's say, uh, at least I do, I don't know how you do, when I pick modules, I always look at the typical statistics or many people using it and so on, but apply it uh, to here. Hey, is this module, if I go with it, how much effort will it take to upgrade it to Drupal 8? I was just wonder, does this make sense to use it like that? To make, publish it as a metric on the uh, homepage? That's what I mean, like, mm -hmm. like uh, how complex would it be? I know it's not uh, guaranteed, but uh, mm -hmm. to get an impression like this module someday has to be upgraded to 8, and my, what is the risk I take? Let's put it like that. Yeah. It's more is that a good sure. use case for it? Is that basically yeah. uh, It's a good question. idea. Just my brain is melting trying to figure out how you would calculate that. No, okay, that's the next question. But at least it, worst case, if I have to do it myself because the maintainer for whatever reason disappeared. What, one, one worry about that is uh, context. Um, so a lot of like D6 modules yeah. may not be uh, as useful in in D7, like OG features, for instance, I, okay. is, is a yeah. module yeah. that you know you could upgrade, but OG already replaced a lot of that. Of course, and not, um, but it doesn't say it on the project page for OG features, <coughs> and they have a dev branch of D7. I'm like, why did you guys do that? <laughs> so, the one issue you might run into is having context of where modules. Of live. course, of course. So that's where I'm like, no, oh, it, it might be useful, but but you know what might be useful? <laughs> this is funny, but. We could start a campaign where it's like, if you're using a module, run it through this thing and tell us what happened, right? And it's like, we could just like get a big ba I mean, baseline report of everything, kind of for the top 30 modules or something like that, that we want to make sure are working. Yeah. Um, and then post the patch to the queue to get the port started, right? Like everybody can, anybody can do that. All you have to do is you have to have Drush and you need to have, you need to be able to run Composer update and then boom. And then, so we could have like, we could sick like a hundred people on just like, take a module that doesn't have any ports started, run this thing on it and post a patch. That's it. Yeah. Um, do it in the lab tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, maybe. I'd have to run that. Well, the people who are time. hopefully doing, they're bringing their own modules are going to do that tomorrow. Yeah. Actually, that's yeah, that's true. And, and I wanted to say that maybe not as a public metric, but as a, as an assessment tool for your pro personal project, I think that's Pretty yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, I, and then let's say a variation, but I don't know, maybe this is even a political question or whatever. Uh, if would you, uh, is it possible, are you authorized to do it and so on, to go over the list of all Drupal 7 available modules and somewhere put, use, uh, use the metrics, whatever you get from it, a kind of red flag so that if I'm a module owner uh, and I get a bad metric, Maybe it motivates me to hurry to upgrade. You see, that's another way. But now it's going political. I don't know. Yeah, yeah that is a little political. <laughs> yeah. It's much better to, yeah. it's, it's like we don't want to shame maintainers. No, what we yeah, want to yeah. do is encourage people yeah. to help. Yeah. So I much prefer a thing like, like a call to action. Like, this module doesn't have a Drupal 8 port. Click here and try and port it and give us, you know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. Try to do it. Yeah. yeah. Huh? Dread it. Yeah. Yes, actually. You yeah, have, we could yeah, totally do that with you. Yeah, Dread. you can. You know, pop a thing here and search the page for your paper. Yeah, UX. that's cool. great. Awesome. I just want to be mindful of time. So we uh, we expired our session about five minutes ago.
Um, so I don't want to make people yeah, wait for the next thing. But anyway, you guys, uh, <laughs> mm. that was great. You did a lot of Danny. Really I actually learned a lot in this session, even that. though I work with you every day. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's okay. I learned a lot myself. Yeah, Are you going to get one to thank Cameron so much for uh, Wait, coming. Wait, so Nick, uh, here you go. I'll send this to you. <laughs>